We were on Interstate 70, 15 miles past Columbus, Ohio. Everybody was going about 30 miles an hour. My friend who was driving made it a point to say, I don't know why everybody's driving so slow. It's only rain. It was a February night in Ohio, and it was indeed just rain, and yet the temperature was dropping and dropping quickly. We cruised on for about five more miles without a problem at all. Nobody was in the left lane. We were in the center lane, and everybody else was going 30 miles an hour in the right lane. It was a small miracle that every driver on the road that day understood that unless you're passing somebody, you travel in the right lane. We were passing them, and then the five miles happened. And then the rain had frozen in a spot, and we hit a patch of ice. And from the center lane, we then began to skid into the left lane, and the driver overcorrected, and now on an interstate that we were headed west, we were now going north and south. As we went from the left lane through the center lane into the right lane, an overcorrection again, we went through the right lane, back through the center lane, I saw a truck's headlights coming for us, and it's that second. Everything flashes in front of your eyes. It's that second where you just you grab onto anything you can find. It doesn't matter whether it's one of those handles in the car, whether it's the person next to you, whether it's the seat in front. Of, it doesn't matter. You just instinctively tense up and you just grab onto something because your car is spinning out of control and there is no way that this ends well. And it all just flashes. It happens so quickly, and yet, on the other hand, it seems as though it lasts forever. The car came to a stop spinning in the center median. Remarkably, everybody in the car was unhurt. The car wasn't really even damaged. We had to push it out of a ditch, and my friend who was driving was hyperventilating and swearing they would never drive a car again, and so we're all, we're all looking at each other like, we still have 25 miles till we're back at school. This isn't going to be good. So I'm like, I'll drive, and I drove so slow. I drove that car so slow on the way back. That split second, it reveals a lot. It reveals reveals what you really believe. It reveals how you really feel. It reveals what scares us. That split second, it reveals what we hoped for. It reveals our disappointments and our regrets. It reveals what we're thankful for. When you boil it all down, what it really reveals is who we are. At our core. Because all of us have exteriors. We all have exteriors. Some of that's because of societal norms. Some of that's because what is socially acceptable. But all of us have exteriors where we don't reveal everything that that we truly feel. We don't reveal everything that scares us. We don't reveal everything that pushes us. We don't reveal all that. We keep those things tucked away, hidden neatly behind the parts of ourselves that we let everyone else see. But that split second, whether it's a car wreck, whether it's a diagnosis from a doctor, whether it's a phone call that you never thought you would ever have to experience in your life, wherever it may be on the spectrum, when those events occur and they take our breath away, that split second that just is really a second, and yet it feels like an eternity, it reveals who we really are. Jesus had just gotten done doing something incredible. Miraculous. He had gone to a a town and people had followed him there. And not just a couple people. 
Over 5,000 men had followed him to this town, let alone women and children. And so we're led to believe that there are 15 or 20,000 people who have followed Jesus to this location. And they heard him speak. And then it took place in a place where there was nothing around. So picture a religious Woodstock, and you're like, well, there, there's no, there nothing. Like last time they tried Woodstock, they were charging people $15 for a bottle of water, and we all know how well that ended up. And so here they are in the middle of nowhere, and Jesus is, is talking, and, and the disciples say, we, we've got we've to feed these people, but we can't go get food. And Jesus is like, well, what do we, what do we have to, to use? They're like, a couple fish and some loaves of bread. Per person? No, legit, that's it. That's all we have. And Jesus is like, I got this. I got this. Have them separate into groups. And then we'll just start passing the basket of food. Okay, we have a couple... <laughs> we, have, we have a couple loaves of bread and we have a few fish. And, and you, you want us to get them into groups. There's, there's 15 to 20,000 people here. And, and we're all going to eat. Okay. And they do. And they have leftovers. And it's not because the fish was awful. Everyone ate to their full. And there were leftovers. It's absolutely incredible what Jesus has done. And then we pick up for what's to come. You can follow along on your Bible apps on your phones or on your tablets. If you don't have those, you can follow along on the screens. As we look at Matthew 14, starting in verse 22, where we read these words. Immediately... He made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. They've heard him speak. They've seen incredible things. They've had dinner. And Jesus says, it's time to go home. He tells the disciples, you go before me, get in the boat, go out before me. I'll, I'll handle the curtain call and I'll let everybody know it's time for them to go. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. So Jesus dismisses everybody. They go home. The disciples, they're in the boat. They're out on the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus goes to the mountain. By himself. What we see here is that Jesus made a priority for margin and solitude to be a part of his life. Jesus made a priority for margin and solitude to be a part of his life. I don't know if you saw the recent study that was just conducted and the results were were just released this weekend, but the average American has four hours of downtime a week. Four hours of downtime. That's it. And what happens if we don't put this principle in our lives of having margin in our lives is we become overextended. And I know when I become overextended, I become a jerk. And when other people become overextended, they just become weepy. And so I'm like rage guy, like the Incredible Hulk. And then other people, when they become overextended, they just cry at everything. And it's like, that literally was a commercial for the new orange vanilla Coke. There is no reason, <laughs> there is no reason for you to be in tears right now. Just the flavor explosion is too much for me to fathom, Brian. It's too much. But what happens is when we don't have margin in our lives... We're headed down a dangerous path. And the people that are closest to us, they don't want to be near us. And sometimes they have to be near us, and then they're not having fun, and we're not having fun. And it's a miserable, 
miserable thing. And I just want to encourage you, if this was a necessity for Jesus, how much more is it a necessity for us to make sure that we are responsible in how we manage our calendars and make sure that we take care of ourselves, that we build in downtime and we don't overextend ourselves constantly, saying, well, it's all a grind and we just got to push through. And oftentimes when you boil it down, what that reveals is a lack of faith or a lack of dependency on God. We just we are determined that we will accomplish it all. We'll handle it. Make time for yourself a priority. Jesus did. It's not unspiritual for you to do that. In fact, it's a key to you becoming more and more like Jesus, and it's a key to you growing to become even even more like Christ. It is a spiritual discipline. And now, what do you do with that time? That you say, I need margin. I need time away. I need time to reflect. I need time to think. Connect with your creator. Connect with your creator. That's Jesus went to the mountain by himself to pray. Use the Bible app. Use the Bible app. Engage with scripture. Pray. And we've, we've turned prayer into this ridiculously difficult concept. It's literally just a conversation with God. Pray. Meditate on a verse. Just meditate on the meaning of a verse and, and really wrap your mind around what this means and what it will look like if I, if I put this into my life. Go for a walk and enjoy nature. And see how nature reveals the truth and the majesty of God. But make time for yourself a priority and use it to connect with your creator. And there is Jesus, the top of a mountain, praying. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land. Beaten by the waves. For the wind was against them. There's a storm beating against the boat. And I know with all the, all the technology and all the builds that we have available now, sometimes we're like, ah, you know, you can be out on the water and it's still not the best place to be if there's a giant storm coming, but you still feel relatively safe in all the technological advancements that we have with, with our boats today. But go back in time a couple thousand years and understand the boats that that they're dealing with. And now there's a storm beating against this boat, and this boat is in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And storms in the Sea of Galilee especially develop incredibly quickly because of the atmospheric changes of pressure in the wind. And so storms can come in an instant. I had the privilege of going to Israel a while ago, and after we sat down for one of the worst meals of my life, it's called the the peter fish and and literally there's a fish that is thrown down on your plate like with scales still on it and the eye is still in the fish and i hate fish to begin with i i I don't like any fish uh i'll occasionally do shrimp but like i'm like no fish is gross don't no and then i'm like well i'm gonna be really hungry if i don't eat this um if you ever go to israel i'm just telling you pack snacks and nothing but a suitcase because the the (laughs) I mean, it's a majestic place, don't get me wrong, but the cuisine leaves a lot to be desired. And so I'm like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be really hungry. And so I'm picking the little, little fish flesh out of this fish that you can get, and there's all these little bones. And I'm like, okay, that was fun. And then we got to go on a, on a boat across the Sea of Galilee. And at first, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. The sea was, the sea was very flat. And while we, were, while we were on the boat, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the wind just starts whipping, and, and some storm clouds come in, and we, we avoided any, anything major, but being out there on an empty stomach from the disgusting fish that we were just fed, and all of a sudden seeing that the, this wind is whipping out of nowhere, storms happen incredibly fast. And even for seasoned fishermen, which some of the disciples were, here they are in the middle of the Sea of Galilee in a boat, And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. 
Let me read that again. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Now, we're like fourth watch of the night. That's from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Now, I have had some wild things run through my mind in the hours of 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., and I promise you I was not inebriated. But I have had some incredibly just wild things run through my mind from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. And there's something about that time that, especially for me, the time when I should be asleep and the thoughts are racing and I can't get things out of my mind. There's something especially about those times in the middle of the night where the darkness reigns that you feel incredibly vulnerable. Go back to childhood when you're sound asleep and then all of a sudden the house shakes from the rumble of the thunder, and the lightning strikes enough to light up your bedroom window, and even though the mini blinds are shut, you just see enough light all around your room to notice shadows that you've never noticed before. <laughs> and then you hear something just, just rustle around. Then all of a sudden, the story that your friend told you about a monster being under your bed, which you never believed before, it's true. (laughs) You might cry for your mom or your dad, or you might decide in that instant to be more stoic and start the rough exterior, but either way, you are in the fetal position with those blankets pulled up as far as they can go because nothing can penetrate the blanket on a bed. (laughs) And yet, I found for me, 30-some years later, when the mind is still racing, I feel incredibly vulnerable. I deal with thoughts sometimes that I don't even believe and yet are still in my mind and won't go away, and I'm just exhausted, and I just want to sleep, and yet it just keeps coming back, and I'm like, what is this? I know this isn't true, but why is this thought in my head? What is going on? There's something incredibly, incredibly vulnerable about those times, and when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the sea, they were terrified, and you would be too and said it is a ghost and they cried out in fear the disciples are freaking out because god is doing something they have never seen before and can't understand Some of these men are fishermen. They have spent a lifetime on the water, and they've never seen anybody walk on water before. Here's the deal. God works in ways that will blow our minds. We will see circumstances and we'll see God intervene and we'll say, we have never seen that before. That doesn't make any sense. And when we try to see it all logically, it just breaks down. And it doesn't all add up because there are so many obstacles in the way. There are so many reasons why this shouldn't be possible. And yet God is not confined by the things that we understand. God is not confined by the things that limit us. God is greater than all of our limitations. And God still works in ways that we cannot fully fathom. God still accomplishes things that we cannot fully understand. God is bigger and God is greater. And here are the disciples, and they see God at work, and they're like, it is a ghost, and they're freaked out. And if in your faith you have never had to take a step out and do something that scares you to the core, I'm just going to ask, are you really trusting God? I'm not offering any conclusions for you. I'm just asking the question. Is God bigger in your life than what you can accomplish on your own? 
Because sometimes what we love to do is accomplish a lot of great things. And then we're like, well, look at what God did. And certainly God had a hand in it, but so did you. And if we're being honest, we had a lot bigger hand in it than God did. Is God blowing your mind? Is God accomplishing things that there is no other explanation for other than God? And I want you to know that is my hope and my prayer for Lakeside, that we would look and we'd say, yeah, I don't know. (laughs) This is certainly not this idiot. (laughs) But look at God work. Oh, the dependency when we see that God blows our minds and does things so much bigger than us and so much greater than us and things we can't even fully fathom. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And they're like, it's a ghost. And Jesus is like, no, it's me. Don't be, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. How's fear holding you back? What's the storm in your life? Where have you lost control? Where everything was going according to plan, everything was going smoothly. And then the wind kicked up out of nowhere, and the storm arrived. Now you're struggling just to make it. Name the storm in your life. And how are you handling it? Are you scared? Are you afraid? I love the fact that the message of Jesus is do not fear. He didn't go into a theological discussion on how he is able to walk on water and we're not able to walk. No, no, no. What he says is do not be afraid. Don't fear. And as followers of Jesus, we literally have nothing to fear. Oh, some people aren't going to like us. Okay. Okay. We have nothing to fear. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. And man, I love Peter because he's just like, prove it. You're a ghost. You are a ghost. Prove it. And Jesus is like, come on. And Peter's like, what do I have to lose at this point? Let's go. And he hops overboard. Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. God may call you to do things that seem crazy. God may call you to do things that are way out of your comfort zone. And to do some things that they seem like they don't make sense. And when that happens, the first thing I would advise you to do is share that with somebody. Because it might not be God calling you to do that at all. You might just be a little crazy. (laughs) We all have the little streak, okay? Some a little bigger streak than others, but you might. You might just be a little crazy. So I would talk to somebody about that. But God sometimes calls us to do things that on the surface don't make any sense whatsoever. And here's Peter, literally walking on water. And when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? 
And so when everything comes crashing down, literally for Peter, as he sees the wind, he sees the waves, all of a sudden he realizes, okay, it's probably 4.30 in the morning, and I'm delirious, and I've seen a ghost, but it's actually Jesus. And I'm like, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to get out of the boat. And he's like, get out of the boat and walk to me. So I hopped out of the boat, and I started walking to him. And then all of a sudden, I saw the wind, in the waves, and I realize this is not a dream. This is actually happening. And Peter is scared, and the first thing he cries is, Lord, save me. That split second, when everything's falling apart, it reveals who we are. Jesus reaches out his hand and he pulls Peter up. When your life is falling apart, when we're sinking, in that split second when it all sinks in, you cry out for Jesus? Or do you rely on yourself? Jesus reaches out his hand, he pulls him up, and he asks Peter, why doubt? Why doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Their conclusion is Jesus is God. We have just seen his deity on display, and they worship him. He has done the extraordinary. He has done the miraculous. They have seen it with their own eyes, and they are left with but one conclusion, and that is Jesus, you are God, and they worship him him because they have seen Jesus work something's always bothered me about this maybe when you were little and you went over to grandma's house she had one of those pictures in the office of Jesus holding a little shepherd in his hands like a baby maybe petting its head Long brown hair of Fabio, but turned brown. Perfectly manicured beard of Jesus. Little smile on his face. He pets this little sheep. Or maybe Grandma had a picture of this hanging up in the office. Of Jesus out on the water. The waves big. The rain falling. Peter halfway under the look of terror on his face like you see in yourself when you ride a thrill ride and they take that picture of you and then you don't go buy it because it's like $270, but you at least look at it at the end of the thrill ride. Why is it in every depiction we see Peter underwater? He was the guy who was willing to get out of the boat. Now, at some point, did his actions leave something to be desired? Yeah. But nobody else was getting out of that boat. There will be people who want to define you by your failures. There will be a voice in your head that wants to define you by your fear. question is, will you let it? Will you let all of your failures and what people say about them and think about you hold you back? Or are you willing to follow? To get out of that boat see God do some incredible things in your life. And knowing that at some point 
you're going to realize the wind is still blowing. And the waves are a lot bigger when you're walking on water than they are when you're in a boat. But if you lose your step, and fear creeps in, but Jesus' hand has reached out. He's ready to pick you up. And pull you to safety. God, I pray that we would be people who are willing to follow you. No matter where you call us, no matter what we face, God, that we would not be people who allow ourselves to be defined by our faults and our failures and our fears. But we would see ourselves as your fault. Help us, God, rely on you. And it starts with us making sure that we connect with you. So help us connect. And then when you call us to do incredible things, even if they don't make sense, Give us the faith we need. And when we lose sight and we start to fall, pick us up and help us keep going. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.